Hi, I'm Rebecca Futo Kennedy, and I'm an ancient historian and professor at Denison University in Ohio. Welcome to Peopling the Past. So what topic am I going to talk about today? Today I'm going to talk about the issue of women and immigration in the ancient Greek world. I've done a lot of work on this topic over the last decade or so, um, but there's always more information to explore. So I'll start with what some of my driving questions are and why I came to this topic. The first one is um, that when I read studies of migration or immigration and mobility in the ancient world, most of the time you see just discussions of men. We learn about mercenaries, we learn about artists, we learn about, we learn about merchants. What we never learn about though is women. Also, whenever we do see women, they always basically show up as refugees um, in war zones or in times of extreme crisis. But didn't they actually also maybe move for economic reasons? This is a question that has troubled me a lot. Also, when I do see women mentioned in histories, I always see them mentioned as sex workers, as if that's the only thing that could have made women move in the ancient world. And if it was also only something that lower class women did um, in the ancient world, i.e. moving for economic reasons and therefore only being able to find work that was sex work. What you see in our sources predominantly is that these lower class women who are always classified as foreign or dangerous um, are almost always dismissed by scholars or they are demonized by them um, in some ways as actually being as dangerous as they are represented as being in our sources. The other question that I then sort of worry about is, well, if they aren't actually these things and, and why aren't they showing up in these histories, what evidence do we actually have that we can use to help reconstruct who these women are and why they move from place to place? Because we have lots of evidence of women actually moving, if you know where to look for it. Then I have to think about what actual methods can we use to help us use this data, which is really disparate and very vast, um, in ways that are useful to helping reconstruct the past. Um, so this is what I've sort of been working on for a while. My past research focused on the city of Athens, and I can sum up my scholarship, my scholarly findings in one set of images. The image, um, the tombstone image that you see on my left is um, a tombstone for a woman named Phanastrate. She was an immigrant woman to Athens. We don't know where she came from, but her father is called an isoteles, which is a privileged member of the immigrant class. She worked as a midwife and a doctor for the family that probably put up this tombstone. On the tombstone, they thank her for all of her hard work on behalf of the family. The tomb on the left, or the image on the left, is actually from a drinking cup. And what we see here is how scholars almost always represent immigrant foreign women in Athens, which is as high class prostitutes who drink too much and spend all of their time at parties. My research showed that that in fact was not the case at all. <laughs> it's just a scholarly assumption that we make when you're dealing with evidence that suggests that foreign women are dangerous and sexually promiscuous. Once I finished up my research on Athens though, I ran into the problem of, well, first off, there's still tons of evidence for Athens, but the Greek world isn't just Athens. And oftentimes you run into a problem where we make an assumption that Athens equals all of ancient Greece. So I had to ask myself a question. Bigger question is, well, what about immigrant women in the entire rest of the Mediterranean world? What about them? What are they doing? We know that thousands of them actually went to Athens. We have a lot of evidence for their appearances there, but they didn't just go to Athens. And the other question is, you know, where else did they go? So I've started a new project where what I'm actually looking for is trying to figure out um, how women moved throughout the Mediterranean world and where they went and where they came from. So what do my sources and data look like? Well, there's a lot of different evidence that I have used in the past, um, primarily um, literary texts. So courtroom speeches are great ways to find foreign women because they're always being accused of crimes or they're being associated with men who are being accused of crimes or they're being called witches um, or they are being called prostitutes. So um, I've spent a lot of time in the orators from Athens, Demosthenes, um, Lysias, Isaias, and all these other sort of very famous um, speech writers. Also spent a lot of time in places like Herodotus, who gives us perspective on women who are outside of the city of Athens. Um, I've also used tragedies in the past because they always love to represent foreign women like Medea or Phaedra or others as really dangerous to the life of citizens and to the polis. 
But for my new project, um, I'm really emphasizing um, a different type of evidence. And this evidence I also used um, in my study of Athens. But in order to get this sort of bigger picture, you're not going to be able to find as much literary evidence or courtroom speeches or other such documents to find them. So I've been focusing my studies on grave tombs. Uh, so grave stelae, or I just call them tombs because stelae is a Greek word that most people don't really understand. Here I have four different ones represented um, from different museums uh, and from different fine salt spots. And what we learn from tombstones is it's probably the closest thing that we're going to actually get to women or their families representing themselves. Um, this isn't um, enemies, combatants in a courtroom representing these women hostily. This isn't a tragedian or a comic playwright imagining who these women might be, but actually them sort of, or their family members, or as in the case of Fanestrade, the family she worked for, um, honoring them and commemorating them upon their passing. So how do you actually read a tombstone and how can that help us understand um, women's movements and migration in the ancient world? So here's a basic tombstone um, for one immigrant woman. Um, this particular one is both for her and her husband. And so I'm pointing to the screen as if you can see me pointing to the screen. Uh, <laughs> but what you can see is that there are two figures standing. There are actually three. That's their son and a smaller child in the back. So there's four figures on here, but the two primary ones are the woman seated and the man standing. They're holding each other's hands, which is how we know that they are man and wife, in what is called the dexios pose. The woman who is seated, um, her information is right below her. The man who is standing, his information is right below him. So we actually have a tombstone for both the father and the mother um, and probably put up by the older child. Or it could have been carved even before they died, um, having it ready in advance. This is not unknown. So how do we read a tomb? Well, what we want to find out is how do we know that she's actually an immigrant? One of the easiest ways to figure that out is first you find her name. And here's her name right here. It's Iconian. Then we have her father's name. She's the daughter of Andromachus. Here. The next thing is our key. We see what's called an ethnic. That's this right here. And it tells us that she is from Antioch. And then at the very end, we have an, what I call the niceties, which is someone saying she was the best woman ever. Farewell, which is a very common thing to see on tombs um, when someone has passed away. You're wishing them well into the ancient world. Our key piece of information that we have, though, is this thing we call the ethnic. That tells us that the person who's buried here did not identify or was not identified as a citizen of the place in which she lived. Now, we have some problems that I'll sort of muddy the water here, um, that we can't tell if she moved there her, in her own lifetime or if her family moved there previously, because in many cities, you didn't actually get citizenship simply by being born into a city. So you could be living in a city for two or three or four generations and still be counted as an immigrant. But it does tell us something about how people moved around. Uh, so this woman, um, as I said, is from Antioch. Her husband is from Antioch as well. Now, Another piece of information that we can use to help us understand whether or not someone immigrates to a city and how immigrant women moved around um, are things that we call citizenship grants. Now this picture is of a drawing made by a scholar over almost a century ago of a series of stones that used to be part of a gigantic wall that were in, found in the city of Miletus. These uh, inscriptions actually list the names of people and where they're from who were granted citizenship within the city. One of the most interesting things about this inscription is that it contains the names of hundreds of women, not just men. And so it tells us that women were moving to Miletus. Miletus is a coastal city, um, and so it may have in fact been a place that they were settling because of economic reasons. One of the things that's so great about this particular inscription is not just that it has women, but it also is datable. We can actually date the times when these uh, grants of citizenship were given because we have other inscriptions that go along with it. So these are the kinds of information that I've been using to try and figure out whether women are moving around and then where they are moving to and from. Once I actually gather all the data, which I've been working on for a couple of years now, and I probably won't be done for another five or six years, um, I do searches amongst the data uh, and add them all into a big gigantic spreadsheet. I know it's like super romantic and sexy kinds of research. <laughs> um, so far, what I've done is I've been searching people by their actual ethnic. So what are the different ethnic markers that we might find? 
most people don't realize that when we talk about the ancient Greek world, what we're actually talking about, not what is now the modern nation state of Greece, but Greek people living um, who identify as Greeks, who use the Greek language, who maybe have various types of Greek cultural um, investments, um, who live on three different continents all over the Mediterranean. And the way that they primarily identified themselves wasn't as Greek, but by what their city or their regional indicator was. And these are what we call ethnics. And those are the things we look for on the tombs. So far in my scholarship, I have searched for this list of ethnics, um, but I still have about 400 more to go before I have finished. This is what I mean by this is slow and tedious and arduous scholarship. Um, but in the end, I will have a database that anybody can use to help learn more about the lives of women um, and their movements and immigration in the ancient world. So why bother doing this sort of tedious, arduous type of research and gathering all this data into one place? Um, how can my topic actually tell us about the real people in the past? Well, one of the things that we learned, as I already pointed out from my first slide, is that what I learned is that women weren't just moving places to be sex workers um, and weren't living the high life as high class, high paid um, courtesans in Athens as many scholars had assumed they were from our literary information. What I found instead was that lots and lots of women were working in lots of different fields. They were working as midwives, they were working as wet nurses, they were working as um, industrial level um, weavers, not just weaving at home as domestic product, but actually weaving large scale um, for sale in the markets. They were working as tavern keepers, they were working as um, garland sellers, they were working as perfume sellers, they were working as sesame sellers. Um, all different types of things, even shoemakers. We have women um, being recognized as shoemakers on these inscriptions. So women, it turns out, at least in Athens, as I've always known since I did my um, previous work, have been large contributors to the ancient economy. And we would never have known this if we hadn't started looking at these inscriptions to find out what they were doing. Instead, we would just assume that they were just the layabout drunken prostitutes that scholars have always called them. <laughs> But now with this wider scale information, not every tomb is gonna to reveal to me that same level of really great information that the tomb of Fanastrade is, where she tells us she's a midwife and a doctor. But we can find other things. So while I have found a lot of tombs that show images of women as weavers and other things that can tell us a little bit about how they were viewed in life, we also find women who are being um, recognized for their work. Um, and this is not, labor, but actually see these sort of well-established um, important women in the cities. So here are two tombstones. One is from Rhodes, um, and then the other one is, oh, actually, I'm sorry, they're both from Rhodes. <laughs> Excuse me. One of these women um, is a priestess of the Temple of Artemis, um, and she's from Egypt, but she's moved to Rhodes. The second one is a woman who is being recognized. Um, she's from Ephesus, which was where there was a huge, there's a huge temple to Artemis in the ancient world. And she's being recognized as what we call an ergetus. She's being recognized as a major benefactor and donor to the city. What's interesting about her tombstone is that it is shared with her husband. And her husband is actually not from Ephesus. He's from Termessus. And Termessus is a an entirely different city. This means that this couple might have actually met when they arrived in the same city together and then married there so that you actually see immigrants coming together in various places and into different immigrant communities in new cities um, and there they're meeting and these communities are merging. So then the question is where have I found so far that people are coming from? Um, they're coming to um, Athens and they're coming to other cities from all over the Mediterranean. Um, these are just the ones I've found so far um, because these are the ones I've searched for, <laughs> right? So Alexandria, um, Ephesus, Antioch, which is all the way up here, um, all over and around. You're finding people from lots and lots of different places. So where are they going to? They actually are going to a smaller number of places. Um, most of them, as I noted, are going to places like Athens. Um, that's actually the largest data set, and I've sort of kept it to the side because it dwarfs everything else. Um, but a lot of people are going to places like Miletus, which the citizenship grants tell us, but also to Rhodes. Rhodes is one of the biggest locations for immigration um, over time. Now, my data set actually covers and will cover about 800 years of time. So that means I'm starting in the sixth century BC and I'm going all the way up to the fourth century CE. And what we actually see is that 
different places become really popular for um, immigrants to arrive at in different time periods. Athens, though, seems to be the most popular at all periods of time. Another way to look at this data, which I've been working on, is to actually try to visualize it in terms of the individual tombstones. Um, at some point, what we'll actually see is these will be linked up to, this is just where they're going to. At some point, I'll have it linked up to where they're also coming from, and we'll be able to build network maps of where people are moving across the Mediterranean. I haven't put Athens on this map because it would actually cover the entire slide. Um, it's four times as large as every other piece of data I have together combined. <laughs> Um, but that's an important, really important fact to know about immigration in the ancient Mediterranean. Why do we spend so much time talking about Athens? Why do we have so much evidence from Athens? Because Athens is uh, tended to be one of the most important sites, but there are other sites too, and those are the places that I hope to explore and hope to provide information for other people to explore in the future.